would like to raise awareness on their climate justice work. Initiatives for Change and the Center of Expertise on Global and Inclusive Learning would like uh, students to address a very specific um, and highly important issue that relates to the Dutch educational system and the right to education. The World Fair Trade Organization would like to receive recommendations on how to engage effectively with mission-led enterprises to advance trade justice. So you see that we have this very broad spectrum of justice issues and um, the topics and um, his opportunities will you know, naturally lend themselves uh, the, the opportunity for the students to um, uh, enhance their social responsibility skills, their ethical leadership skills, and even community organizations. Um, so after this very brief peek into our lab and our background, I would like to give the floor to our speakers. Uh, we will have four uh, speakers today. Uh, Professor Barbara Varvas, uh, Director of the Center of Expertise. Yes, please come in. The Center of Expertise and Global Governance uh, will discuss about what is justice and what is a justice need. Then we will have Professor Guerin, who will make an interactive workshop on what does it mean to uh, you know, participate in the civic sphere, uh, what does it mean, uh, what does deliberative democracy mean. And then Adela Sanabar uh, Gomez, my dear colleague, she will give you an insight very briefly on what the global citizens are going to have um, uh, us joining. Um, uh, Clara uh, Bosco uh, in a uh, keynote speaker who represents Civicus, and they will, she will talk about uh, the dangers of bringing civic space and what students can do to push back and become active members of society. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Barbara. I will get your slides on. And, um, No, that's absolutely fine, and I'm very glad that you're doing this because otherwise I would be probably messing up with this PowerPoint. Thank you very much, Tamara, for this nice opening, and thank you all for coming. It's so nice to see so many faces alive uh, for change. And uh, I will give you a very short, hopefully, introduction on what justice for uh, what justice really is. And I will do this from very specific perspective, and then we will move into more interactive part. But indeed, if you have any questions or if you would like to participate, please raise your hand, and I will be happy to answer your questions. So. Uh, please have a look at the picture that uh, I included. Actually, I wanted to say that while preparing this PowerPoint, uh, you also get some, uh, get some suggestions from PowerPoint. And for justice, we have very specific suggestions which refer to formal systems of justice. You see the special scale that is always associated with justice or courtrooms. And I found it very interesting also for the presentation here today. So I decided not to follow the template. And I included a picture, which is a picture of a, a website uh, uh, of the project of Trust Mediators, through which we uh, learn with students from their cultural experience and evolution and justice. So I just would like to bring your attention into the shaking hands from uh, the start of this presentation, because I will return to this uh, while speaking about justice or what it really is or should be at the very end. So today we speak quite a bit about justice, uh, or we have spoken in the last two, two years at least. And uh, I think a, a fact about me, I'm Polish. So I also have some pictures from Poland here. And you can see uh, when we speak also about justice these days, we speak about rule of law, about backsliding of the rule of law, 
we speak, uh, here are the pictures of demonstrations in uh, support of judges uh, in the context of the legislative changes that were and still are discussed in Poland. These demonstrations also concerned uh, discussions about human rights, women's rights, women's reproductive rights, uh, and they are still quite valid. Uh, you also see two individuals behind me on the screen. Uh, the, these are two judges. The first lady, Małgorzata Gerstow, used to be a, a Supreme Court uh, judge in Poland. She was very active and uh, uh, even activist in supporting uh, rights of judges and population. And then you also see Igor Tuleja, who is a judge who was suspended and now he's future professional career is uh, rather unclear. Some of you uh, Dutch speakers uh, could have seen recently the movie, which was called uh, Judges Under Pressure, and he's a very active figure in this movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to do so because it's a really fascinating uh, story, and I wish it wasn't true, but it is. So uh, just in sum, today when we speak about justice, uh, we mostly talk about justice from the formal perspective. And uh, at least uh, in the public discourse, uh, we speak about rule of law, we speak about judges, we speak more and more about the role of judges in, in the society, uh, but also in judicial systems, we speak about what judges, uh, what judicial systems are for, by whom they are founded, uh, how they are organized, especially in the EU. So these are, uh, this, these are the news that I think you are all familiar with. And because I'm a lawyer from a legal perspective, we very often speak about justice uh, from the perspective of formal systems to courts. And uh, what is interesting, and I think it's known to all of you, is that justice very much is understood in this context as adversarial system, where we focus on winners and losers. And people, there is always one side that needs to be, uh, needs to win essentially, and for which a judge will make a decision and verdict. And uh, uh, whether we see it as fair or not, it would need to be followed. Uh, and then we also have some concepts which are a little bit maybe technical, but I will just point to them uh, very briefly. From the perspective of these formal systems, we also uh, speak about maybe you came across this procedural justice. Procedural justice is this something what associate what we associate with fairness of the procedures. So if there are some rules that regulate how judges make a decision, we as subject of those rules expect that there will be fair. Whether it is so or not, it's a different story. And also because we speak about it from a very formal perspective, or we learn about it and study this, we very much focus always on those formal systems, which are justice systems in states. And then we also, there is something which is called substantive justice. Substantive justice is the more focus on the outcome. So what we want to get out of the dispute, conflict, the case, uh, it is supposed to also be fair, but it is mostly focused on what we are supposed to achieve after uh, some judicial proceedings. And then to uh, wrap up this legal part, Act, uh, we often speak about access to justice. Access to justice is understood also in every country as a legal term. It is access to court, so your right to go to court and ask the judge, am I right or wrong? Uh, right to an independent uh, and impartial tribunal, and so on and so forth. This is, I think, quite boring, and it is also very disassociated, or maybe not, that's great. I see somebody disagreeing, which is good, but the, uh, what I mean by boring is that it's very disassociated from us as human beings, and it's very disassociated, disassociated from us as uh, members of the society. So, uh, why is this so? I don't know if you have ever wondered where these conceptions of justice that we have like, come from. And uh, what uh, we essentially uh, focus on in our center of expertise and in the research group on multi-level regulation is uh, 
about where the uh, is we focus on where rules are coming from and uh, what we think is the reason for thinking about justice in a very formal way is that because we really associate rulemaking and justice with state formal state systems which roughly go back to the Treaty of uh, Westphalia, which was the 17th century. And that's quite interesting because this is the so-called modern world. And this is the paradigm that essentially uh, affects all our per perceptions, not only about justice, but about the world and rulemaking and us as citizens. So we perceive the origins of rules and us as members of the society, all in these very formal terms. And in our research group, we say that it's a very limited approach. We say that uh, we very rarely look about rules and conceptions of justice before legal systems were even created. And uh, we uh, also say that uh, we always associate the so-called social capital with, uh, of rules with states. But in fact, social capital is something different. And what is it? It is our sharp understanding of rules, regulations, and values, which are also very important in our understandings of what justice is or should be. And uh, we also uh, associate, so uh, we in our uh, research group, social capital with very humanistic values such as trust, cooperation, reciprocity. And we find them missing from contemporary debate. And this is, uh, which brings me to uh, the slide about what we don't speak about when we speak about justice today. So there is some research, which is also uh, led here by the Hague, uh, here in the Hague, by the Hague Institute for Innovation of Law. But there is also a lot of research on justice in developing versus developed countries. And based on this research, the anecdotal evidence, so it's not a hard uh, rock science statistic, 5% of disputes only that people have around the world make its way to courts. What it means for us, it means that 95% of disputes conflicts don't even make the way to courts. And this is exactly where we as human beings experience justice. And it's very interesting to say that what is missing in our current formal debates about justice is exactly this 95%. It's exactly how we people perceive justice, how we resolve our disputes in formal or in informal ways mostly, but also how we cooperate with each other, how we build communities, and how we develop each other as humans. So interestingly, uh, the claim that we are making also in our research group is that we in fact focus the whole research about justice or the whole studies and work about justice uh, on something that is an exception, not the rule. And uh, we call exception something what may be the rule. And so here is where we come in also with our research. Have you ever heard of something which is called alternative dispute resolution? That's very interesting. Oh, you you did. It's great. It's um, gold in search of the course. Yes, of course. So essentially, uh, there is something which is called alternative dispute resolution, and it's very funnily called alternative because it's actually uh, not any alternative. It's called alternative to courts. So it proves the point that it's treated, uh, treated as an exception, but in fact, it uh, really means how disputes are solved outside. And this concerns uh, processes or means, tools. There is no clear cut definition of alternative dispute resolution, but it concerns negotiation, it concerns mediation or arbitration. And media, uh, negotiation essentially need two sides, and each of us negotiate, there was some research which says that each of us negotiate at least three times per day. 
So if you have some misunderstanding or if you uh, want to ask your colleague or friend what you want to have for dinner and you disagree, you negotiate. And so it's so essential that it's a skill that you all have or it's a means of dispute resolution slash communication that you possess now. So you already have, but it's finally called alternative dispute resolution. Then there is also mediation, as which is classified as alternative dispute resolution, when you essentially have a one neutral person, a mediator, who is supposed to help two parties solve a dispute. And then there is also arbitration, which is rather formal, I would say, it's because you have uh, uh, very formal rules of procedure for arbitration. And what we say in our research, and what I want to discuss also with you today, is that this alternative dispute resolution is actually where justice happens every day. So this is something quite informal, at least in our uh, in the historical understanding how it looks like, but this is something what each of us does on a daily basis. This is dismissing 95% from the debates about justice. And what uh, is also maybe interesting, uh, and I would like to share a few examples, is that now we speak about negotiation, mediation, arbitration, also in a quite formal way, because it, uh, these are the means of dispute resolution outside courts, but they are still advertised and popularized by states and very often by lawyers. But uh, what we study in our research group and the research that I will be very happy to share further with you is also what happened before states even were created or modern states were created. Because these are, and we call these early dispute resolution. Here I wrote that these are examples of historical ADR, but it wasn't called ADR uh, hundreds of years or many centuries ago. And I uh, put a few pictures for you as examples. You have certain philosophies like Confucianism, where you really focus on cooperation and on uh, harmonious uh, societal life and dispute resolution. You uh, gentleman here, it's Marco, he's, uh, it's Marco Polo, who was also very much uh, solving disputes in a, a 16th century trade disputes through arbitration, which was a very specific system for traders to arrive at just results. And then below, you have a very traditional African uh, dispute resolution systems, uh, Gachacha courts, and also Ubuntu philosophy, through which we understand us as human beings as very uh, societal uh, figures. So these are all examples of how justice used to look like and what we can take from them maybe for today's time. So what we can learn from this historical dispute resolution or out of court dispute resolution means for uh, to understand justice today or to understand our role in the society. Again, a few pictures as examples. We can learn quite a lot for our social lives, for our professional lives and political lives. Uh, two pictures in the, in the middle uh, are pictures of, first picture is a picture of neighbors and the second is a picture of uh, family members. Uh, you use out-of-court dispute resolution today, and some of those uh, means of dispute resolution are based on historical uh, dispute resolution uh, means, where you really focus on achieving social harmony and a just result for, part, for those who actually had a dispute. So it really is focusing those uh, dispute resolution means are focusing uh, on um, people, not very much on the systems. And in the Netherlands, we uh, have an example of build the middle, which is also a process of community justice. You can use it also as a neighbor or as a community member where you have different uh, uh, actors participating in a discussion about what happens and what went wrong and how to uh, fix it. 
for the future. So, for example, this is also very popular in uh, this resolution is very popular in uh, small criminal cases. If there is a violent behavior in the community, there is a practice of community conferences where you can come all together and discuss and find the best solution and result. And then, of course, uh, dispute resolution can also serve as a means of co as a cooperation model in the workplace, but also it can serve as a means of social integration for refugees and migrants, which is also very important today in the Netherlands uh, and everywhere, of course. Uh, and there is a picture of ODR. For, uh, for refugees, which is an app that was developed in Greece and it was used by um, social and workers who work in the camps with those who arrived to Greece and it served to uh, both as a dispute resolution means, but also as a means to um, help integrate um, and economic and uh, social migrants more in the society. So this is essentially uh, also uh, maybe to wrap this uh, up. I wanted to let you know that there is something else than the formal justice that we may think is the only way of understanding what justice is. We as humans have a strong uh, power to uh, resolve disputes for ourselves and to also shape the ways in which we act within societies. And we can learn quite a bit from uh, dispute resolution or alternative dispute resolution, as it's called now, because those uh, means are very flexible. Uh, they allow us to experiment, uh, co-create and co-design how uh, we want to uh, resolve the disputes, but also how we want to uh, achieve social justice. So it's not really a dispute resolution only, but also means of advancing social justice, so equality, inclusion, and our uh, very uh, harmonic coexistence in the society. One of the very uh, maybe uh, uh, down to air examples of this uh, that we have here at us is a project on trust mediators, where we work with students on a mediation lab, uh, through which we want to develop informal knowledge on dispute resolution. We call this informal knowledge wisdom of the crowd, and we ask students to share with us their cultural observations, their or their peers, on what are the traditional, maybe communitarian ways of uh, solving disputes and building trust with their peers, with their family members. And then we translate this into uh, a word mediation map, as we call it, into this informal knowledge of how we uh, can learn how to uh, coexist and work together and study together in a multicultural uh, environment. So uh, we will, depending on your coordinator, of course, how uh, flexible and uh, how much space you have for your uh, program for your lab. I will be more than glad to invite you also to take part in our press meeting or slab and uh, co-create how we solve disputes here at TUAS. That would be really lovely, but I wanted to give you a few tips just for the start. I know I already exceeded my time. I apologize for that. But I would really like uh, to invite you to be really very creative and to uh, understand that justice is essentially what you mean it is. It, you are uh, the, um, those who shape how justice should look like. And I think that you should think very big in these terms, in this project or uh, program. And uh, you should uh, not fear from deconstructing justice according to your own experiences or experiences of your family members. It may be very important for us to learn from you. So um, I think it's important to help yourself and others uh, to uh, co-create uh, this justice system. And uh, if there is room in your program, we will still determine this. I will invite you to uh, do a little survey about justice needs to us 
to understand what kind of potential issues you face as students. And then I will invite you to uh, read a little bit more about peer mediation. So a uh, form of mediation in which peers solve disputes uh, together in a very trusted environment and to let us all know uh, how the ideal system of peer mediation at UAS could look like. But we will see if there is room for that. So far, thank you very much and uh, good luck with your uh, achievements. <laughs> Is everything going well with the online? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Laurence, and I want to work half an hour with you on. Uh, I have three questions I've prepared, uh, and I also prepared the Padlet that I have to uh, plug into uh, here. Um, but I, I'm less or less to consider what is working on issues that we are concerned with. Uh, what kind, if we think we have a voice. And I will just uh, start with a little story. Uh, I'm French and I went uh, with my children uh, in May to uh, vote for uh, the parliament. Uh, and my daughter, one of my daughters said, yes, I'm really, really pissed off uh, about these voting things because I think youth should have a uh, stronger uh, voice when it comes to climate change and our because it's our future. So uh, we started a discussion about differentiated uh, voting rights. Huh? Could it, how it could be complicated in a democracy? But I thought she had a point uh, here because it's their future and colleagues who are working on deliberation and intergenerational deliberation on topics, they found exactly the same thing. All the people are less concerned about climate changes, not everyone, than younger people, and then starts all the discussion. So it's very interesting. And what I would like to start is I have... Um, Yes, we can. I can show you. Do you have your Oh, yes. So I would like first uh, to answer this question. So I'm a little bit curious about what do you think about uh, global citizenship and what it does mean to you? And you can uh, enter advent.com slash gchhs slash gcc. We'll open another one. Advent.com. When you write it from here, so what does global citizenship? CHHS? Just one C. Uh, no. Oh, it's one C, sorry. Right. Oh, I have the. Then I write it. Oh, and then you just click on the plus. 
to enter you want to add yes on the plus yeah yes. Level.com slash GCL. Oh, GC, not the L. No, this one, it's for the second one. So I see people it works. Yes, I see people writing. Yes. Yes, with everyone, uh, people are. Does someone uh, want to explain what uh, he or he has written? Okay. For example, shared responsibility and being interconnected. Who, who wrote this? No one? Don't you dare to talk. Yeah. I was curious about the shared responsibility. Well, I didn't write anything, but I put a heart at uh, somebody who wrote, a more diverse world where social inequalities do not exist. And then she says, even though that is very optimistic. Oh, that's wonderful. And because it changes. Oh, this one, there are two yeah. hearts. You can put hearts as well. I thought being diverse and still equal. Yeah. It was one of the two ideas. Yeah. So what's interesting when I'm asking students or people to uh, say what they think about global citizenship. Huh? So there is this idea of shared responsibility that comes often uh, to mind, diversity. But what what really strikes me each time is that uh, uh, often the political dimension doesn't pop up. So uh, uh, so. Uh, for example, all the uh, political action of Greta uh, Thunberg about climate change and climate justice, all the Me Too uh, movements, these are global, which I would say it's global politics, what's happening there. And often we forget that in global citizenship there is also politics, there is the social. Yes? Isn't it an umbrella term? So it's like input to a lot of like environmental, societal, and political factors, basically that uh, globally minded people are nurtured and try to solve. That's how I feel. Yes, but I would say in citizenship, huh, when you look nationally, you, you, you would have exactly the same points huh, that could be made. And what's difficult now, and sometimes I have really difficulty with uh, having, making a, dis a distinction between global citizenship and citizenship, except that when you are born in a country, uh, you have specific rights and uh, duties because you have a certain nationality. But what I find difficult is because it's so difficult to say I'm a nationalist <laughs> in the sense, not in the political sense, but in the sense as a human being and the way you live, because we are so interconnected. So we see it with the energy crisis in Europe uh, and with the uh, but we see it uh, with what we are wearing, what we are eating. So we cannot 
it's just like it's a fate that that global that we that the global is always in our house in what we are doing and so the shared responsibility is very important but it's also important uh, to look into what kind of political action uh, we could organize and there have been a lot a lot of uh, deliberation and the united nation itself uh, uh, well there is the global citizens uh, no i would say the, the global citizenship assembly uh, for example and they try to change the agenda of the United Nations. So they are uh, like platforms that are organizing themselves in order to uh, give the voice of uh, people all around the world. So it's very interesting development, and I don't say it's perfect, but I think we should uh, not only think this way, because I, I, I agree on a lot of points, but we should not forget the political in it. And when an NGO asks you to work on more climate change, for me, it's just a political act to start working on such things because they have, and they are uh, saying something. Uh, they are uh, saying this is our message and we're standing for this and you are working on this. So it's also not only a social action, but also a political act in itself. So it's very interesting to work on this kind of uh, politics uh, in global citizenship. And what I would like you to do now, because we are running out of time and I don't want to take too much, I would like to um, to um, write on this post-it. I have small one and big ones. And my first question to you would be: What global societal issues you are worrying about? So name three. Put it on the post-it, and if you don't have something to write, I would like to have some contemplation. Yes, I'm not sure. And you can, uh, you can, uh, yes. Can you write down the question, maybe? Yes, here. Put it here, and you can uh, put your post-it here. Should we write it in all different ones, like one each paper? Yes. Oh. Oh, I think you can do more. Yeah, it's like a very good news. I love the national page. What have you like to change? And this is my job. It's a lot of Yes, do we have to write for all of them or only for the first question? For the first question, and then we will look at the Perfect. So, and when you are finished, you can put it and stick it here. We are going to. I cannot see it from far away. No, it doesn't matter, but we, we because we all will move here. Yeah, if you go ahead, I'm still thinking. <laughs> Thank you. 
We are more concerned to take action on things we are worrying. So I would like to invite you to come here and to look at what everyone has written. <laughs> so, do you, do you think you have like a uh, common concerns? Data, data, uh, artificial intelligence. No? Oh, you did. <laughs> Does someone want to say something about uh, what you have written here? It's like, yeah, um, so I was recycling, but it's kind of like, I think there's a very bad thing that recycle. Most of it is shipped from the Western major countries to Asia, Africa, then shipped. And that goes into the air because we're burning it. It's like, we did a whole project about recycling. Scares me to see how less transparent, like how transparent, how more transparent we become all the time. 
and I've me myself I'm very active on social media or LinkedIn sometimes etc. And maybe back in the days I have posted things that were a little or like I don't know as every young person does. And then sometimes I start thinking about okay this it's very eternal like it can never go out of the internet and especially with the with all the softwares and the technology we have nowadays always more people become access and have the skills to really find those things or like just to look through all our data and that scares me personally. I guess I have a little story because I was working with someone who has lost her daughter in the uh, in the flights uh with the Maso uh how is it M H yeah, so he lost a daughter and we started the project together and she told me uh, a few years ago they had a website from the family and they took it off and they closed it and journalists could uh, find it yeah. Huh? Yeah, uh, yeah back and so then they were at the door and uh, so it's not even IT specialists no and that, that's what scares me that we really we really transparent Someone wants to say something about Ulta and the war in the Middle East? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, uh, last week it was uh, climate week, uh, uh, a lot of lectures, and then even the experts uh, with all the uh, reports are saying, well, within 10 years, we have the first world war on water. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, people are just scared and cool yeah. in their eyes. Like, yeah. It's so near and we are still closing our eyes. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I have a second question for you. What would you like to change? So perhaps choose pick one and what you would like to change and how you would you like to change? Then we will go to the last one, which is from do you have the idea that you have a voice and what politics? How, what do we have to change in the world so that you have, can have a voice on these matters that concerns you? Perhaps we can do two and three together. Let you first think from, okay, what would you like to change on one of the issues? You go a little bit more in details and then you do the third one on what should change in the world in the way we uh, do politics in the world. For you to have a voice and to be heard. Yes? Okay. There's a question here. Yeah. So I have more post it. Yeah, you can swap if you want. I saw another, or I have another pen. No, it's okay. Oh, we have other pens. No, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Maybe mine. Ik heb toch net kunst. Ja, maar dat is iets heel lastig. Ja. Nee, meestal heb jij één. Ik heb het niet. Ik heb het niet. Ik I hear the 
should we just be waiting for you to think that you have a decision in the Yes. Want to move past it? Yeah, but <laughs> okay. Uh, what should change in the way how it works for you to have a voice in the decision making process? Um, uh, no, I got it from one of the countries in the And yeah, I guess that the just the I mean, it's just Is everyone finished? Well, there's some people who don't have any idea, so thoughts to share. Ja, dan ben ik benieuwd, want de seks tegen mij komt er nu aan. Oh, ze zijn. Oh, uh... perhaps we can come here again. Oh, someone coming in right now. Was it like a subject? I don't know. Yes, if you can something that you I was curious because he was here the first. So they see what. Oh, now he's dropped out. Yeah. Then, um, do you want to explain a little bit more? Your idea? Yeah, I think uh, the exploitation of the town and also racism in the building work is a very important issue that we need to address. But it's also causing, or it's not causing, but like it's also accelerating extremism and climate change. And it's unfair because they're also fleeing the people from the global south to the global north, and then they meet racism again. And 
it's just very unfair. Yeah. And I think democracy needs to be more inclusive, like usually citizens vote vote just not vote vote if um in front of team where you can not only vote for representatives but also for the laws. Yes. Uh which I think is amazing. Yeah. It takes a long time, but not everyone is inclus included in the um, decision making because uh, people who don't have the passport, who don't have access, get it costs a lot to get citizenship and also to uh, to kind of uh, get access to the information because it's all in German or in French and not everyone can speak the language quite fluently. It's not accessible. It just needs to be more inclusive. And we need to participation in policy making because I feel like They don't even if they're at the table, they give them the voice, they're not taken seriously. And so we need to work on more means and participation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. But if you think a problem is really a problem in democracy, it's in the representative democracy. Huh? So how to include everyone everyone? It's really democracy means ruled by the people. And then you organize yourself. Uh, and we think about rules. Thank you very much. It's really interesting because there are things happening here. Yeah. This, but uh, is there someone who would like to share this? Oh, their uh, uh, thoughts. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I need to I didn't write much, but thank you for taking by it. Like I was like I agree with what she is saying. Like uh, I wrote this one. Yes. We should give more voice to communities and politics take a way over. Like, but I like the real matter is that we should be prepared. Like in the moment, I'm from Italy, yeah. and I actually like we can vote from when we we're 18. I went just once because they don't even give us the right education of how to do it. So we don't even have the ways to understand like who we're voting, like what we're doing. And so we don't even understand what rules we're making for ourselves. Yeah. So like they don't give us away, but I do believe like now that I'm growing up, I do believe it's it intentional. That's what we do because they don't actually want us to have a goal, a real goal. So, like we could say, you know, this is not working, so we need to change. Because everybody's like complaining, but nobody now knows how to do it. Yeah. Like how to make it change. Yes. And what do you think? Do you have someone who likes to react? Veronica. Veronica says, especially uh, the last point she makes, does it raise us? Yes. Yeah. I just noticed. Yes. You have a Sometimes uh, some positions we are not I didn't know I see those places like for the first time. I, 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 at the time I wasn't like a age to go to election, but that will be the thing. This is like that answer. Oh, so the surprise. Yeah. So yeah, like as I can agree that some at some point you don't know what you elect. Yeah. Like you can not be a global citizen if you're not first a citizen, like where you're coming from. Yeah. And we don't want to be feel like that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like you're just living your own life and you have the sidewalk why. And they're yeah. like managing everything and you do it as an appointment. Do you feel like this will be solved to your education? To an extent with um, education reform? Because I feel like if education would be even more focused, essentially, um, just to show actually how to be involved in politics, that can make a change. Yeah. And we have the class with this. Yes. 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 On the education thing, uh, I have been wondering, and maybe it's strange, like the high school curriculum, and uh, they're less. Like in history, it just been uh, less focused on international, and just less really focused on national. 
and I do believe that this will ensure that local citizenship that it's really hard like that to actually understand their certain political treatment of the post or what the post was for the third part of the job. And I do hear that we have to get to a which is actually just yes. To make like an end of nationalism. They, they just want to basically what I'm also from Hungary. Yeah. And the issue they are really having is great complex, but they are really like the politicians are really racist and they want to like put up this religious view. And for example, a few days ago, they even changed our abortion yeah. law. Yeah. And it's, um, it's not just also in other. Uh, like in an education field, for example, like after I graduated, I heard they are um, they are not going to teach um, a lot of things what I also learned because it's very like it's LGBTQ stuff and like a lot of like yeah. di really diverse things, and they are basically excluding that from textbooks, yeah. which yeah. I think it's very important to put it in because yeah. then you just have this like really like narrow mindset on things and not get the full view on other yeah. things. And that's why also our voting rights are kind of like reflected in like one direction. Yeah, but that's what they want. Right? Yeah, obviously. They want yeah. to not have an open yeah. mind. Yeah, yeah. that's like why that. I wrote also to propaganda there because that's also a really big issue in yeah. voting and how like political system genuinely works. Yeah. Especially like I feel like in like yeah. if you come Eastern Europe or the South um, or from any Balkan area, you really can really to these kind of things because it's a really big issue. Yeah. There. Yeah, I get it. Like in the point, yeah, you exactly. cannot get like a parade. Or, like, yes, at, at the beginning was like super tough. Yeah, for those people, and right now it's a little bit easier. But they we have some sort of anti-government people who don't work for the government. They work for Russians, but they're like, oh, the Russia is so great, blah blah blah, and it's like a great country for living, but they don't live there, and they say like those things, and like. Do something that's not okay. Yeah. Also, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to break it because this is such a great discussion. Yes, let's let's we have it. to move on. Yeah. <laughs> let's keep it for the for the reception because there everybody can yes. enjoy. I'm yes. sure everybody has some experience. Yes, and then we can we can also move on with our yes. Let's, yeah. um, I'm coming back uh, for uh, another workshop on democracy, so we can. This in mind, uh, we will take picture and we can uh, build on what we have uh, discussed and perhaps discover uh, other ways of uh, doing democracy as we see this one way of uh, doing it uh, and it has its drawbacks as well huh? because it's not ideal. And then I can explain uh, because sometimes it's quite small and then I can explain what we are doing as to as to give students a stronger voice in the uh, quality uh, of education and the organization so we can discuss a little bit more about this and the views and ideas about it. So thank you very much for your cooperation and uh, for uh, telling us about this conference and the kind of solution you're thinking in of and uh, and when I do this I have to get recognize some kind of people I like to read um, a politician scientist who are really have a to do on democracy and we could make a change. So that's all you're trying to Thank you very much. And uh, you have to move on. Uh, we have <laughs> Thank you so much. Now it's uh, really fascinating. Um, I'm so pleased uh, that some of the concerns that you guys shared, so the north south divide, it will be addressed with our fair trade and trade justice um, project, the equality and you know, even the racial equality uh, will be addressed by our access to education, education being really the, one of the most powerful tools to create equality and equity in the world. And then of course, climate change, we're gonna have our ecocide, ecocide project to address that and uh, dispute resolution and this, uh, the, the divisions between communities is how do you create these uh, dispute resolution mechanisms to, to really, you know, harmonize uh, the people, how people live together and, and have some mutual respect towards each other. Now, we have a few minutes for a very, very important topic, and that is our, that is the presentation of how the very beginning of our 
program uh, looks like. So for the first three weeks, you guys will be working um, based on you know, your individual case, uh, following the global citizenship uh, unit study uh, module. I will share the Brightspace link that will hopefully work very soon. And Adela will give you a brief insight. And I think that now it really comes to get a picture on how the topic of global governance and, and um, you know, democracy, deliberative uh, democracy and participation connects to global citizenship and also our projects. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I cannot be happier to see you working on these topics. I get really enthusiastic already because this is just the introduction of a great topic that uh, lies on my heart. And uh, I feel I want to adopt you all. <laughs> Just come to me, please. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a very brief introduction because you already got in touch with this topic. This is what we do uh, with the Global Citizenship Certificate. So basically, we start at the very beginning. We start with you. Who are you as a global citizen? So we work on uh, different sides of your identity as global citizen. And I heard some of what I wanted to jump in, but I wanted to <laughs> intrude in this workshop. But this is the way we will go about in this certificate. And we start by this kind of prompts first to get deeper into who are you really as a global citizen? How do you feel about your roles as a global citizen? Explore first your identity to move on to the global citizenship. And I just was thinking about something very small. I wanted to give you an example of how it works, because this module just was born uh, in the lessons here at The Hague, when uh, in a different classes, people just talk about SDGs, the Sustainable Goals, and global, and you have to be a global citizen everywhere, and global citizen needs to be tested everywhere. Well, this is an example. My daughter started last year, first year at high school, and she has a friend, a very dear friend of hers, who likes girls, but she was very ashamed of that. And uh, this topic of gender just was for her really kind of troublesome. She wanted to help her, her friend. So what did she do? She came home and she started making stickers. So she spread all these stickers. I have it in, all, uh, in my work phone, in my uh, home phone. Uh, and she just gave it along the high school to all different kinds of people. She brought it to the lessons. And I found it such a beautiful example how to raise your voice. Because people think that raising your voice is the one who cries or who just shoots, uh, shouts louder. But actually, raising your voice means something else, and you can just show it in different ways. And this is just a beautiful example that I want to share with you, just to encourage you to raise your voice in the best way that fits who you are, because this is very important. So I'm going to show you very briefly as well an infographic, if it works, if the screen works with me. That shows the essential of global citizenship to explain you a little bit. So we work with challenge-based learning, and we start first with oh no, it didn't, it didn't work out. See? Okay, never mind. And I will move on to the PowerPoint back. Don't worry. It's just that this is not always working. Well, it has to do with the framework that I wanted to show that it has to do with identity. And identity is not only uh, you, yourself, being. So what do we do is linking the knowing, being, doing. And some people start with the being, doing, knowing, because not all of us are thinkers. Not all of us are doers. I'm just a dreamer. So I start with the being, connecting with some other sides of myself before I work on global citizenship topics. So basically, uh, we go about all these cycles so that you may choose consciously what is my challenge here in global citizenship. And your challenge is not my challenge. It's saying that my challenge is not yours. So I cannot think a challenge for you. You have to figure out what is your challenge. And these are beautiful examples where you can start with. And then we go about the UNESCO five pillars of learning to know, learning to be, learning to do, learning to be together, learning to transform, and to discover how did you make an impact. So this is 
the important side, and Barbara mentioned also beautiful examples uh, that will come across in this uh, beautiful program that you will find for sure a lot of challenges that you can work with. So basically we go through different stages and you will get an e-learning. This is the basics, the e-learning, you can do it on your own. And you can complete a couple of assignments. So per module, there are three main modules, and then Lawrence will come to do another workshop with you, a recap. And uh, when you complete this part, we will move on to the challenges that belong to the global governance. So this is an overview. We have uh, three different sessions and we have different topics. I will not bother you. You will get this in the Brightspace page. Um, and this is just uh, also information you can find in the portal. We have a own tile, that's beautiful, amazing. And in the extracurricular programs, but we have also a Brightspace page where you will get all the information all about it. And I have some examples for you on uh, examples of projects that we have, for example, a big hackathon that the students build from the ground on the future of learning. So I heard also some topics here on your future that could be amazing to work out in different formats. So this will be an example. And I cannot make it shorter. So um, we also have a walk to Santiago de Compostela that is my own hometown and we did we work on SDGs while we did a walk, a mindful walk, uh, and it was part also of the global citizenship program. And I think we need to move on because this is not working. Mm, no, it's just stop there. Oh this is not working. But this is part of the thing from Mori. We go back. And we have a Global Citizenship Award at the end of the year, normally around June. You will, we will, you will get to know about this. And so when you achieve your challenges and you work out, you can get a certificate. So that's my story. Thank if you. you have any questions, I will share my space and another link for you. Thank you. So you see that these first three weeks, I give you a very solid foundation and it's more like an, an inner journey of a step by step to internalize the work global citizenship is, what it means to you, how you approach it, how you approach it as an individual, as a part of the community. And then with that very solid knowledge, we're going to move on our hands-on project, a very practical project. And I also want to tell you that those of you who are from the, from the MNO department, mm -hmm. uh, you will get one EPT for completing the uh, study unit, but we are working on having the entire program accredited. So that probably won't be applicable for you guys, but for the next editions, we can offer uh, the credits for the course. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to our keynote speakers. Uh, and we're going to have to do a little bit of uh, magic with our um, setup here with the computers. I really hope it's going to work. Um, we have Clara with us. Can I help her? Uh, if Great. Um, Clara, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, does it work? Not you, yet. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Yes. Can, can you, you hear me? You can see us, but for us, it doesn't work just yet. I can see you. The big screen. Sorry, Clara, just one second. No, okay. We're trying to figure out. Absolutely. 
Maybe. Otherwise, you can just turn it around. Yeah, mm -hmm. Thank you. And then we can uh, maximize uh, Clara's. Uh, the output is the can it's directly in. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are working mm -hmm. with a wonderful Mac computer. <laughs> Strange. So that I am going to um, maximize Clara. Yeah. I don't know if that that is because it seems to be. All right, so otherwise I will just introduce Clara. Clara is a senior advisor uh, working on civil society resourcing. She is, um, uh, can, can we just uh, maximize Clara's? Uh, so she uh, works with Civicus, an incredibly global, incredible global alliance working on empowering, uh, organizing, um, advancing civil society actions and uh, citizen involvement. They are the headquarters is in Johannesburg, and I know that Clara worked there before. She's currently based in the Netherlands, but um, she had another engagement today. So thank you so much uh, for doing two of these uh, this afternoon. Um, and um, um, yeah, so uh, you guys can join Civicus yourself. So it really is open for citizens. They have wonderful contribution to so many, uh, you know, reporting to international organizations and uh, an incredible advocacy um, role and, uh, and involvement. And we are so happy to have Clara here. Uh, uh, she had worked with Civicus for a very long time and also for Oxfam in the past. And we are almost uh, there with uh, starting, but... Uh, <laughs> um, Yes. There. No, you don't have the link. It's in it's on our website, probably. Um, um Clara, uh, you know what? We can just start. Yeah, yes, yeah, of course. Thank you, Thank you so much. And we will turn around. Sorry. Here's everybody. This is Clara. Thank you <laughs> okay. so much for being with us. No, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invite. It's really, really a pleasure to be to be speaking with you today. Um, and so I'd like to briefly introduce you, um, Civicus, really briefly, and then um, I was asked to share a bit more about uh, the state of civic space and civic freedoms, which is something that is um, quite close uh, to our heart at Civicus. I'll try to share my screen. I don't know if you will be able to see uh, my presentation. I hope you will. One second. Um, uh, can you see anything? Yes. <laughs> All right, super. OK, so quickly about Civicus, and, and I think that Tamara uh, has mentioned already a bit. Um, so Civicus is a global alliance dedicated to strengthen citizen action and civil society around the world. And uh, we are a member based alliance. We have members in over 175 countries. Uh, we have over 12,000 members and members are both individual citizens and organizations. Um, the membership uh, age of, of our members has, has changed quite uh, drastically over the last uh, six, seven years, and now 30% of our members are under 30 years old. So there's a very uh, a new wave, I would say, of, of young activists joining the Alliance um, um, and, and in fact starting to shape a bit um, the ways we work um, collectively. Um, so uh, I think was mentioned before, uh, Civicus is headquartered in Johannesburg. We we have also small offices in Geneva, New York. That's where we do our advocacy with the United Nations mostly. But then we have also various colleagues spread around the world. And one of them is me now based here in, in the Netherlands. And um, we uh, have a vision of a worldwide community of committed citizens that are engaged in the big challenges that are facing humanity. 
And um, the goal that we are giving ourselves for the next five years really reflects our emphasis on actions that are not just about defending and, re and reacting to the threats um, um, that uh, we see growing around um, civic freedoms and democratic values, but also to improve the conditions. So really to be a bit more proactive and, and less reactive. And this we will try and do um, building on over 20 years of experience by building solidarity among um, civil, civil society actors across borders by supporting civil society to connect with other actors outside of, of civil society, by producing timely and world-class knowledge and analysis on the state of civic, of civic freedoms and civic space and on the state of civil society. So to provide you know, um, uh, information, sources, analysis and discourses that come from within the sector, within civil society, and, um, and that can counter some um, public discourses or, or narratives that are um, trying, in fact, to delegitimize the essential role that this sector plays. Um, we advocate for open spaces and systemic changes. We um, tend try to amplify voices of parts of the sector that represent groups that are traditionally more excluded or have been histor historically oppressed. And we try to promote better resourcing conditions for different parts of civil society. Um, this in a nutshell, it's very difficult to explain the range of things that we do as an alliance uh, of a, such a big alliance. So um, I hope this gives you a bit of a sense of the purpose and the types of things that we do. We always do th these things in co-creation with and collectively with our members. So I'd like to start by just sharing how we understand civil society at Civicus. So the way we define it is really an arena more than anything. Uh, you can imagine it more, more than anything as a conceptual arena outside of the family, the state and the market, uh, which uh, is created by uh, individual and collective actions. So there's an emphasis there, not only on the collective actions, but also on the individual actions. Um, that's as I said, both individuals or organizations take forward to advance shared interests. Um, and so our definition of civil society is therefore much broader than what many think it is, which is not only about NGOs, but is really about all sorts of NGOs indeed, but activists, uh, coalitions and networks, protests and social movements, voluntary bodies, campaigning organizations, charities, faith-based groups, trade unions, philanthropic foundations, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So quite broad, uh, a quite broad um, family, uh, I would say. And in all its diverse forms, and uh, e civil society plays essential roles in our communities. It could be on the side of service delivery, delivering services, assisting some communities. It could be in as a represented, representative voice of some groups that are marginalized, or it could also be in terms of holding governments to account and, um, and being more active in participating in, in decisions that are made uh, and in governance processes. Um, and, you know, I think uh, over the last two years, we have seen you now the the display of the various civil society responses that have happened uh, during the pandemic that really show the essential roles that it has played. Uh, as I said again, by supporting communities with some service providing like face mask or information about the spread of the pandemic to the other range of more accountability uh, uh, aspects or advocacy aspects when it when it came to, for example, keep in check governments that were um, restricting uh, rights, freedoms um, in a way that in many instances was disproportionate and, and in many instances was really just an excuse to stifle dissent in, in some countries. Um, and so these various roles become even more essential as we keep navigating times of uncertainty and the social conflict and polarization that we are seeing uh, right now. And so what we need, we as civicals advocate for is the need to protect 
and to promote a well-resourced, a well-networked and an autonomous civil society as a public good, which governments and other actors should recognize, should protect and should enable. And the fact, the emphasis on, on it being uh, an actor in its own rights is an important one because oftentimes it is mistaken as an implementer or as an um, opera operating arm of governments or the private sector. And, and, and only in that sense, it is given a space. Um, so if this is how we understand civil society, then for us, civic space, is that space, physical, digital, or conceptual, where civil society operates, where people can speak out, can organize, and can take action. When civic space is open, citizens and civil society organizations are able to participate and communicate without hindrance. And in doing so, they are able to claim their rights and influence the political and social structures around them. And this can only happen when states hold by their duty to protect its, their citizens and to respect and facilitate the fundamental freedoms to associate, to assemble peacefully and to freely express views and opinions. These are the three civic freedoms that are the pillars of civic space and of civil society, combined with, as I said, the, the, the duty of states to protect and uphold these rights and freedoms. Um, I'm going to quickly um, explain a little bit what each of these freedoms means. Uh, and so the freedom, the right to freedom of association is the right of any citizen to create and or to join a formal organization or an informal group to take collective action. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, there was a bit of. Um, and the. Um, and also the right to join existing groups, which is not always um, allowed for some people. Associations can, uh, sorry, the right to association can include uh, all sorts of formations. As I said before, um, religion associations, NGOs, cooperatives, club, uh, trade unions, foundations, etc. But also less organ, less. Um, but also more informal um, groups and uh, such as movements, for example. And the, the, in, in law and according to international norms and standards, there is no requirement that the associations have to be registered in order to enjoy the right of freedom to association. And under these rights, as, uh, groups have also the right to access funding and resources, which is a, a source of great concern because more and more around the world in many countries, under the excuse of the fight against terrorism and money laundering, um, um, many laws are being introduced that prevent certain groups or the sector writ large to access resources and funds from, for example, overseas, from other countries. The second pillar is the right to freedom of peaceful assembly. And this is the right for citizens to gather publicly or privately and to express collectively to promote, to pursue and to defend common interests. So we're talking here about meetings, protests, strikes, sit-ins, demonstrations and all sorts of temporary gatherings with that, which have a specific purpose. And states not only have an obligation to protect peaceful assemblies, but should also take measures to facilitate them. Freedom of peaceful assembly currently is one of the freedoms that we think um, is is being um, uh, and is, is under threat the most. The third pillar is the right to freedom of expression, and of course, as as it suggests, includes the right to access information, to critically evaluate and speak out against the policies and actions of state and non-state actors, and to publicly draw attention to and carry out advocacy actions that can promote. Um, uh, raising awareness about some concerns um, without having fear of retribution from anyone. And uh, so again, uh, people uh, should be assured the freedom to carry out also investigations and documents findings under this right without fear of repercussions. 
And now when we're talking about this, the, the, this, the duty of the states to protect civic freedoms, basically this duty is built into each of these three core freedoms with an understanding that a state must go beyond simply refraining from interfering in citizens' enjoyment of their rights. They actually must actively take steps to protect people who choose to associate, assemble or express. So when states actively protect rights, civil society groups can pursue peaceful causes and express themselves without fear of retaliation. Demonstrators are protected during public gatherings and so on and so forth. And so when rights are violated, the state duty to protect also means that there should be police investigations and legal proceedings on these right violations. When such steps are not taken, impunity for those who attack civil society prevails. And this sadly is something that we see more and more around the world. Now, what is the state of civic space around the world? At Civicus, we created a platform that it's called Civicus Monitor. It's been there for a while. I can't remember, but at least seven to eight years. And um, it's an online platform that is powered by over 20 organizations within our network that tracks almost in real time the conditions of civic space. It analyzes the extent to which the, the three uh, rights, uh, freedoms that I've mentioned just now are being respected and upheld, and also the degree, the degree to which states are protecting civil society in general. Uh, the various organizations that collaborate on, the, on this platform provide evidence and research that help us target countries where there is a risk on civic freedoms. We cover 197 countries um, and we classify them um, on a five point scale according to the degree of openness uh, and therefore of enjoyment of these freedoms. And so this, this five point scale start ranges from uh, closed, repressed, obstructed, narrowed or open based on a methodology that we have developed and uh, refined over time that combines primary data and secondary data. Um, um, and the, the ratings are basically peer reviewed by, by an independent panel of civil society representatives. And the, the ratings are peer reviewed at least once a year. But if something happens, any circumstance that requires an earlier review, this is done. And that's where that's why I say we practically almost in real time are able to correct our ratings of, of, of any country. Now, the Civicus Monitor data has been unfortunately showing that year after year, there is significantly less space for people to exercise their fundamental freedoms. Um, and this is what is commonly um, referred to and quite in fashion, I would say right now, as shrinking civic space. So if you look at this map, uh, and if you think that everything that is uh, orange or red means that the, the conditions are really, really serious. Um, if you look at the world map, you'll see that overall uh, civic space is under attack. Now, uh, looking at the state of civic space, I am drawing from a report that we publish every year towards the end of every year which is a bit of an analysis of all the information, all the data that the monitor platform has been gathering um, over the year and, and, and draws some analysis and some trends. So uh, what I'm sharing with you now is the, re is the report that was published at the end of 2021. In a couple of months, we'll, we'll release the new one. But uh, as of then, um, nearly two people live in countries with the worst rating, no? the closed. Um, where basically authorities are routinely allowing to imprison, injure or kill people for attempting to exercise their fundamental freedoms. Among these countries, we have included China, Saudi Arabia, Turkmenistan and 21 other countries. Um, Nicaragua and Belarus joined their ranks just a few months ago. And so, um, as I've mentioned before, the condition of civic space got worse during the pandemic because um, many countries have used this excuse as a as an excuse, this situation, sorry, as an excuse 
to uh, restrict further the possibility to um, um, organize, to protest, or even to criticize. Um, so we are concerned with a range of trends, but one that could be relevant perhaps for, for this group, although I'm not so sure, is the fact that civic space conditions in Europe are declining. And Europe has always been one of the greenest areas in the world. And there's this wrong assumption that many of us had that being a de 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 mature democracy, have hosting quite uh, many mature democracies, some of these freedoms would be a given. And unfortunately, that's not the case. So again, over the last year, for example, um, the monitor has dropped ratings um, in various countries in Europe, like Belarus, Belgium, Czech Republic and Poland. The deterioration of civic rights is alarming also in other regions and countries, um, most, uh, mostly, uh, I, I would say, a bit everywhere around the world, but perhaps focusing on what are the kind of violations of civic freedoms that are happening more frequently around the world. The one that is by far the most frequent, and again, it's unfortunately the top violation for the second consecutive year, is the detention of protesters. According to the Civicus analysis, or at least they were able to track that protesters were detained in over 90 countries last year, and that excessive force has been used against protesters in over 70 countries last year. Um, I have all sorts of examples that I could give you, but I'm not sure we have enough time. So just invite you to look um, in the monitor page. You will have uh, a report that explains it more in detail and gives more examples on the sorts of um, incidents and violations that have happened in, in various countries. Um, another thing to consider when we talk about civic space is that civic space is not shrinking equally for everyone, has not been shrinking equally for everyone. And one thing to, I think, say, you know, uh, upfront is that this big concern that now is being discussed in global civil society institutions about civic space is something that only now matters to some because until recently it wasn't affecting them. And only when it started to affect their daily operations, like restrictive laws to register in some countries or to move money from one country to another, that's where many of these global big organizations woke up and said, oh, wow. But before then, already you had groups, especially those operating more at, at, the, at the grassroots level and representing, you know, marginalized communities or oppressed groups in, in very parts of the world, they were already being you know, prevented from enjoying fully uh, their civic rights. And there was very little solidarity, I have to say, from other bigger and more established organizations. But just to say that, again, according to the analysis of the monitor, these are the groups that um, are most commonly involved in civic space incidents. Um, the youth is a relatively new entry, and it probably has to do with the massive mobilization of young citizens that is happening, that has been happening over the last years. Um, and uh, I think that it could be useful. Uh, sorry, Tamar, how much time do we have? Because I, I could skip this slide if, if we're running out of time. Uh, maybe a few more minutes, because I think there might be questions. OK, so yeah, maybe, like maybe three minutes of, and then uh, for question, a few questions. Yes, That's of okay. course. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I won't enter into details, but again, I invite you to perhaps have a look at the State of Civil Society Report, which is another publication we, we, we curate every year, which kind of summarizes a bit the major trends um, of things that have um, an intersection with civil society, with its, its organizing, its action, um, challenges or even victories of the sector. And these uh, that are projected in the slide are some of the overarching trends that have been identified for this year, uh, which kind of intersect with aspects of civic space and civic freedoms. So one, for example, is the fact that um, protests to demand economic justice have shaken countries in every region this year, um, uh, including in authoritarian states. 
and people are really protesting against poverty, inequality, rising prices, unemployment and regressive taxation, things that are really more and more directed directed to their own personal, the impact of, you know, um, what's going on around us in their daily life. And that we do expect that um, these this 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 satisfaction and 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 this hardship is going that we're all experiencing in, in in some countries definitely more than others and some people definitely more than other but we do expect that the current trend would would likely lead to cycles of unrest and repression um, over the coming months. Um, there is an aspect again of of the, you know regress. Democracy is regressing. No, the the processes and the institutions of democracy continue to come under attack in many places, including through military coups and the degradation of democratic institutions by elected leaders. And this continuing influence of the far right in multiple countries. And again, uh, civic space, civic freedoms have to be protected if we want to have plurality of views, if you want to have checks and balances in place. And this is a source of great concern. I won't enter into details on the other aspects because I think we're running out of time, but really invite you to have a look at this uh, report. It's, it's, it's not very long, but I think it's very inspiring, especially for global citizens um, like you. And so just to close uh, an invitation to all of you to consider, you know, take action on this cause by really, um, you know, staying informed, in documenting mo more yourselves about what is the state of civic freedoms, what are the, your rights as citizens, speaking up for open civic space, denouncing, reporting, documenting restrictions, um, you know, taking also strong positions against reprisals or threats or attacks against human rights defenders or activists or, or groups, um, making sure that during elections, um, there, you know, there, there, these freedoms are respected. There is a tendency of of of, of re restricting uh, some of these, the enjoyment of some of these freedom during elections. Now, there is a something that's it's quite in fashion now, which which are the internet shutdowns just around election time, just to give you an example. Um, and then also find ways to help counter toxic narratives and. And, and discourses that are delegitimizing delig um, the sector. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm um, sorry the, about the echo. Thank you so much, Clara. I think it's really eye-opening um, the ongoing, um, the ongoing uh, uh, developments and. Um, your predictions. Uh, we had uh, a little bit of an exercise that what the students said concerning it is is for them, um, and there um, there are quite a few issues that you mentioned uh, also came up in the conversation: the violence and uh, oppression, inequality, um, feeling a little bit hopeless in their individual capacity of making a difference. So we are hoping that with the projects that we would do, uh, there will be an opportunity to um, to work on these issues. Um, I would like to give a floor to a question. Maybe if you guys have a, a question, uh, that would be, this is your chance to Clara. Is there any questions? To be fair, we had quite a heavy uh, conversations before, so um, any questions, guys? Well, I have a question. Yes. Um, I don't know whether Clara understands me. But Can you hear us, Clara? Can, Can you hear the question? Yeah. Yes. I'll try to explain it. Yes. I was wondering if you were explaining about the civic rights being restricted mm -hmm. by governments, of course. And then I was wondering, are we as citizens, uh, maybe uh, by, for instance, by expressing hate towards each other or toward other groups, 
uh, restricting each other's possibilities to speak out? And is that something that Citibus also looks into? Mm -hmm. So are, the, are, are citizens part of the problem of this oppression? And is this something that Civicris is doing? And maybe this is an, an excellent question. That. Really an excellent question. So in our analysis, not necessarily in the in the monitor rank ratings. That's, wait, that's wait. can you hear me? Uh, sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, you were muted maybe. Yes. Ah, okay. yes. Okay. Thank you. So it is an excellent question. In fact, civic space restrictions are not only enacted by governments, but also by non-state actors. So one, one important actor uh, is the private sector, the big corporations, extractive industry. Um, there's a historical uh, battle there, for example, with land, defend land rights defenders or indigenous communities, and there are very sneaky ways um, in which those big corporations use their power and, and, and the resources that they have that are disproportionate in comparison to what um, some of these uh, citizens and groups do to, to stifle them, to silence them, to threaten them. And for example, there's the so-called slap uh, uh, um, cause, uh, cases, no? So the, law, the, the, the with legal, legal prosecution is used as a tool to... to um, threaten um, uh, people uh, to prevent them from continuing um, um, denouncing or, um, or even assembling, uh, in fact. Uh, when, when you talk about the citizens uh, being an impediment to civic space, it's a really, really good question. Indeed, um, citizens can do that, although um, I, I can't really answer art in an articulate way. Indeed, they can. What one thing that is of great concern for us is the rise of the far right. The far right as a movement where citizens, you know, um, uh, united in, in their vision of the world are actually um, in different ways um, trying to prevent others from enjoying, enjoying human rights and not necessarily only civic rights. So in that sense, it, it, we can say that citizens can also uh, uh, be a part of the problem. And of course, another thing is when, when citizens buy into these narratives that are uh, being crafted by governments uh, against certain groups and let them restrict freedoms for these groups, because after all, you know, they don't, they don't see these as, as a problem. And so in many instances, for example, there are countries where some groups are targeted as or are depicted as puppets of foreign governments uh, and uh, and so uh, imprisoned or their uh, or organizations dissolved, their offices raided, their bank accounts frozen. It's very, very frequent, but the citizenry of those countries uh, doesn't really uh, protest. They, they find this uh, something that is possible. And this is problematic because I, I think this speaks again to that lack of solidarity, that lack of understanding that civic space is a container for all of us to enjoy our rights as citizens. And so the moment you um, close your eyes, if some of this is being denied to some groups, um, you are um, inevitably letting this, the system um, advance in, in this repressive trend and you know, you could, your group, you could be the next one to be um, um, targeted. I hope this answer, but the excellent, the, the question is excellent. Um, not an easy one to answer. Yes, thank you so much. Now you address so many points, you know, the division, the hate speech, the, um, the uh, twisting of facts, the, um, yeah, annihilation, um, and yeah, um, you know, I just it came to mind the QAnon um, propaganda in the US, but Europe has its fair share, fair share of propaganda that has so many implications of individual lives and political power and the, and the exercise of political power as well. So uh, thank you so much for this very complex uh, answer. And this will definitely give us uh, a, a, a huge amount of 
food for thought for our discussion and for our project work and and we, you know, we couldn't be more um, privileged to have you and Civicus at the very beginning of our work, an organization that brings together our, you know, the global governance, but also the uh, participatory democracy strand um, um, positions of our research. So thank you so much, Clara, for being with us. Also, thanks to all the colleagues at Civicus, and we wish you a lot of success with your work. Uh, and thank you for everything that you do for us. I think uh, many of us will sign up to be part of the Alliance and to you know, advance the work uh, for, for all of our benefits. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you for having us and absolutely please do join the Alliance. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much, Clara. All the best. And thanks to everybody who stayed with us online and to also to everyone who came here today. Um, to be part of the uh, of our event, um, I think uh, it will be. Yeah, we have so much to talk about, and I will, I'm happy to stay as long as you guys want to stay about your struggles and your observations of of uh, justice needs, and and then before our work begins on the project. Now I noticed that there were more students here who than the number that who signed up for the project. Is there anybody here who hasn't signed up for the lab? Sarah, I know. But do you want to join the lab? <laughs> Don't worry, because is it this, this has been recorded, so I just stopped the recording. Um, I will say goodbye to you. Don't worry. I just wanted to invite you. If you wanted to join, uh, we will be very happy to have you. Uh, is there anybody else? Yes? You, uh, you are a guest. And you are very welcome to join the lab as well. If you want to send me an email, if you uh, after this uh, after this session, if you feel like being part of the of the of the the project as well, it runs until uh, mid December. And to everybody, I would like to welcome and invite you for a uh, um, a reception. Are we still on uh, Teams? Yeah, maybe we can turn up the Teams session now. I will leave. Shall I turn up? Yeah. Great. Okay, great. So we have.